I rejoice with those who said unto me, Let us go up to the house of the Lord for worship. Amen. Fellow believers in Christ Jesus, four seconds were left on the clock. And when the coach called a timeout, his players hustled over to where he sat hunched over. They're down by one point, but they had the ball and would be inbounding it from half court. And so they listened intently as their coach drew up a plan. A plan, if executed correctly, would not only win them the game, but the championship. Have you ever wished you could eavesdrop on a timeout like that? I'm always curious to know what coaches are planning. You'd have the inside scoop. Maybe sports isn't your thing. Have you ever wondered what composers like Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, said to the instrumentalist before going on stage for a concert. Or maybe you've wondered what the outgoing president said to the incoming president. We're usually not privy to those kind of conversations, and so we're left guessing. Not this morning. This morning, you get to eavesdrop on a conversation which comes from none other than Jesus himself, the chief shepherd. Words of advice that are primarily aimed at me, your pastor. But it's good for you to listen carefully to these words because through them you'll see how the chief shepherd intends to protect you, his flock. Listen to the words of our text as they're recorded in 1 Peter chapter 5. The apostle Peter writes, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So far, God's word. It used to be that if you wanted to learn how to sew or fix your car, you'd have to seek out an expert and learn from that individual in person. That's not the case anymore, is it? You don't have to join a sewing or a car club to learn skills. You can go to YouTube. And there's thousands of experts that are eager to share with you tips. No need to sit down with someone and be face to face. You can be autonomous. You can be on your own. And if you're getting advice that you don't like, you just go on to the next YouTube video. Unfortunately, that's how many people approach spirituality. They say things like, why do I need organized religion? Why do I need to go to church? What I believe is between God and me, I don't need anyone. I don't need some pastor who wears a gown on Sunday telling me how to live my life. The words that I just shared with you, however, the Apostle Peter would disagree He says, and he is speaking to me as a pastor, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. But do you see how these words also apply to you, the flock? Peter just comes to us with the understanding that we are a flock, that we are a gathering of believers. As sheep huddle together, we are to do the same thing. We're not like moose, solitary animals that are off on their own, doing their own thing, and can care less about anything or anyone else. We come together for the purpose of what? So that someone cares for you, so that someone watches over you, and that someone in this case at Mount Calvary is me. 
What is my role as your shepherd? To feed God's Word, but also to protect, to warn against false teaching, to warn against temptations which would threaten your walk with Jesus. Now, as your shepherd, I prefer speaking words of encouragement, but I also need to speak words of rebuke if that's what's needed. The Apostle Peter did that in his first letter here to his flock. He said, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Do you notice how specific Peter is? He doesn't just say, hey, behave. And then he leaves, leaves that to you to define what it means to behave. He's very specific. Get rid of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. And of course, these aren't the only descriptive words that Peter or other, the other apostles would use. And so there may come a time when I, as your shepherd, must rebuke you. What then ought to be your reaction? I know it's often happened. People have said, I don't need to put up with this. I don't need anyone telling me how to live or what to think. I can go off on my own and form a congregation of one or two people. And if I need help, there's always YouTube. That isn't God's will for you. He wants you to be shepherded. And so he's guarding against spiritual autonomy, the idea that I am okay on my own. He wants us to band together, to be a flock that encourages each other and has someone who's responsible for watching over us and warning. Of course, there's a danger here for the shepherd, the pastor. God has called me to be an overseer, and the danger is for me to think that God's flock is my flock. And so whatever I say goes. Well, the Apostle Peter also wants to guard against spiritual abuse like that. And so he went on to write, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. What can you do to help me keep from lording it over you? But one thing that you are doing is providing some very capable leaders in this congregation I'm thinking especially men on the church council who have stepped up and who have volunteered their time and they bring their expertise, they bring their talents to the table so that this is a better balanced congregation and the only voice that is heard is not mine. Why don't you pray for these men? Why don't you encourage them in their work? And when they stand before you and get reports on the work that's being done, be here to respond, to give them input. Members of Mount Calvary, you've seen in the bulletin that we do have a voters meeting coming up on the 17th of July and a couple of Sundays. There is a great opportunity to see what your leaders are doing. But members, don't just be passive about this, just receiving the reports. Be eager to join in serving with them. That makes me remember that this is not my gig you are God's flock. And I simply have the privilege of being part of the flock and serving you together with you and the talents that God has given. There was something else that Peter writes here that jumped out at me as I was working on this text. It's these words, serve not because you must, but because you are willing. I find that the longer I'm in the ministry, the more difficult this becomes. Serving because I'm willing, not because I have to. It becomes more difficult because I think with experience can come arrogance. 
I know how to handle this. I, I, I could handle this in my sleep. I know what the shut-in needs to hear if she would just stop talking and listen to what I have to say. It's a special challenge when it comes to preparing the weekly sermon. That's a big thing on the to-do list, and often that's what it can come off as for me, is I just got to get this done so that I don't, don't look like a fool when I stand before God's people on Sunday. And so they don't question why they're giving me a paycheck. Instead of approaching this as a privilege, wow, I get to study the Word of God, and then on Sunday I get to pull back a veil and to share with my people wonderful truths that you cannot learn anywhere else than from God's Word. Ancient truths, which speak to us about an eternal future. One way you are helping me to serve with eagerness rather than out of a sense of duty is, first of all, by calling me to be full-time. I am thankful that I don't have to go off to another job 40 hours a week and at the end of the week think to myself, oh, i got to throw some thoughts together for Sunday. You pay me to spend time studying the text and crafting a sermon. And hopefully you see how that benefits you. Something else that you can do to help me continue to be eager about ministry is to let me get to know you better. I've been conducting home visits and I'll be doing those again come fall. And when I get into your homes, what I get to do is I find out what challenges you are facing, what joys you are celebrating. And then when I'm reading God's Word, it is so much easier for me to connect the dots and to say, oh, I know how this is going to apply to so-and-so. And so when that next round comes, can you make yourself available that I can come visit you and you can share with me how I can better serve you as God's representative? What you can also do, too, is to pray for me. Pray that I would be the kind of spokesperson God wants me to be, not just encouraging, but not afraid to rebuke when that's needed. But to do it in a loving and in a patient manner. I admit, when I started to work on this sermon text for this Sunday, I thought, well, this text is really all for me. But I like the idea that you're eavesdropping on this advice that comes from the chief shepherd because what you see is the depth of God's love for you. He loves you so much that he wants to guard against spiritual autonomy that you can just go off on your own, but he also wants to protect you from spiritual abuse. By those who would think that, hey, you've got to listen to me because I'm your pastor. It shouldn't surprise us that our chief shepherd has such love for us. What did Peter write at the end of our text? When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. How does a shepherd hand out crowns? Golden-tipped staffs, that I can see. But crowns? Those come from kings. Well, because your chief shepherd is also a king. And now consider how this chief shepherd is able to give you and me a crown of glory when we are rebellious sheep. When we go our own way, when we stubbornly insist on doing things my way, and we don't show love to the people around us. I know you pet owners, you dog lovers, cat lovers, and those of you who have goldfish and love them to bits, you will do anything for those animals. Would you do anything for a rabid dog? Or for the raccoon that keeps getting at your chickens? Would you speak soothing words to such an animal? And you'd yell at it, get out of here! You'd set a trap to get rid of such an animal. And is that not what the chief shepherd should have done with us. Instead, he gave his life that we 
have forgiveness. And that we have something to look forward to, a crown of glory that will never fade away. Of course we will listen to this Jesus. For you, it means we're not going to go off on our own. For me, it means that I will not abuse my position. May our Lord Jesus give us hearts that put these words into action. Amen.